All right, all right. Hello, everybody. I'm super happy to have with me today Megan Day, writer for Jacobin, who does a great job explaining the significant differences between Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. Megan Day, thanks for joining me. It's great to be here. I'm excited that we have matching outfits. Yeah, that is hilarious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we are kind of on the same team in a lot of sense. So, <laughs> all right. So Elizabeth Warren has been branded branded as having a plan for everything, but she did not have a health care plan until about just two weeks ago. On her YouTube announcing this plan, she said, quote, we have to fight back because like any big idea, you don't get what you what you don't fight for. And I will fight to get it done. That's Elizabeth Warren on her uh, new YouTube video talking about her new plan. Unfortunately, Megan, the comments are disabled. So I would like to know what how you would respond uh, to that quote about Elizabeth Warren talking about how she's going to fight back super hard. Look, I also think that you don't get anything that you don't fight for. And that's why I find it extremely dismaying that Elizabeth Warren wants to defer the fight for Medicare for all until after a fight for public option. So the public option is um, presumably easier to pass, but honestly, maybe it isn't. I mean, we've got really powerful interests who don't want to pass anything like a public option for reasons that have to do with the pharmaceutical and insurance industry. And then on top of that, you've got, got Republicans who are just going to try to beat back the Democratic agenda, no matter what it is, regardless of content. So uh, setting yourself up for a fight for the public option, which is what she wants to do, just to explain in case people don't know, mm -hmm. what she said is that her, her she wants to fight for a public option first, win that fight, demonstrate to people that, you know, public health insurance is actually a good thing. And it's not just for old people and it's not just for poor people. Let people buy into it and watch it work and then fight for Medicare for all. But what she's really saying is she wants to kick the can down the road. And honestly, the real danger here is that it's going to be extremely difficult to fight for a public option. That's not what people want. That's not what the movement is demanding. There is a passionate, fired up movement of activists right now, not for a public option, but for Medicare for all. And she's basically going to uh, extinguish the enthusiasm of that movement by getting it involved in a fight for something that isn't its horizon. And now she's saying, well, of course, once we win it, then you guys get back in the ring and we'll fight for Medicare for all. But I'm really skeptical that that's actually going to happen. Yeah. Uh, and, and why would you be skeptical, Megan? I mean, hasn't hold on, are you telling me that Elizabeth Warren doesn't have a history of fighting for Medicare for all for the past 50 years like some other candidate? Well, look, I mean, I have looked into Elizabeth Warren's history on health care, and I'll tell you this. In 2008 or nine, she wrote a paper where, wherein, if you read it, it's sort of deep in there. She says that single payer health care does make sense. It's a good program. They have it in other countries. It's obviously the right thing to do, but she calls it polit politically unacceptable at the moment. So in 2012, when she ran for Senate, she was asked whether or not she was in favor of single payer health care. And she said no. That was her. That was the idea of political and unacceptability in action for her. She was basically looking at the polls, seeing that Medicare for all or single payer was not poll tested. And she decided in 2012 that she would not be running on single payer, even though she personally believed that it was actually the smart thing to do. So then, you know, come 20, you know, 2016 happens, Bernie Sanders, by behaving in a completely different way and not waiting for an idea to be poll tested before he popularizes it, he makes Medicare for all a massive demand. And then, you know, he puts forward a bill like he's done many times before. This one's very comprehensive. It's the Medicare for all, but it's the damn bill. And I wrote the damn bill. And Elizabeth Warren um, decides that she's going to co-sponsor it. But Matt, you said something to me on Twitter just this morning. You sent a video that I hadn't seen before in 2016. 17, uh, when she co-sponsored Bernie's bill, um, she said, you know, that she was asked, are you, so you're in favor of single payer? And she said, well, it depends. It depends on a <laughs> This is thing. literally before she's going to a Medicare for all event with Bernie Sanders. Right. This is literally. Right. <laughs> and, and even, she, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 
she wants to make it clear that there are a lot of moving pieces here and yeah. she couldn't possibly explain all of them to you in the course of this interview, but you have to understand that this stuff is really complicated. And so just bear with her, obviously Medicare for all is where we want to go, yeah. but you know, it depends. A lot of stuff depends on a lot of other stuff. Yeah. So, you know, it's 2019, she's running against Bernie Sanders and she's got a campaign on Medicare for all. I mean, it's important that she distinguish herself from the rest of the field. And also presumably she still believes what she did in 2008 that you know single payer is actually the way to go so it's not that much of a stretch for her to campaign on medicare for all but she's pretty vague throughout the early portion of her campaign people say um so what about you know tell me more about this medicare for all plan of yours and she just goes i agree with bernie you got questions you 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 just go ask you ask bernie because i'm with bernie and meanwhile, when she's pressed, she'll say things like she'll say other things like, well, Medicare for all, it doesn't really have details. It's it's a framework or it's like our horizon. It's our ideal system. So a lot of us were watching this and thinking like, you know, she's really not she's really not that committed to Medicare for all. Is yeah. She doesn't talk about it in her stump. She declines to explain how it's going to work. She seems a little bit skittish about it. She's always pushing it off into a horizon. And we got a lot of blowback for that. People said, she says she's for Medicare for all. Why would you question her? This is extremely unfair. And then lo and behold, it turns out that actually she releases her, her plan for what, what, how she's going to fight for Medicare for all. And it turns out that she wants to fight for it after a lengthy and difficult battle for something that isn't Medicare for all. Mm -hmm. And yeah. yeah. And what is that? Uh, so, uh, so, she, so she, you're saying she wants to break, she finally announced this plan. She wants to break it up into a couple fights, um, which one of your colleagues at the Jackman explained like, well, that's setting us up to, to get like, to, to fight for Medicare for all after we're totally exhausted fighting for, you know, these other aspects. So what, but what are these other things? How does she want to break it up? Can you explain? Yeah, she just wants to fight. She wants to introduce a public option bill first, win it, use it to prove that Medicare for all would be great, and then fight for a Medicare for all in her third year. And many people have explained that traditionally, your third year is not when you've got the juice. That's not when. That's not when people are excited. That you're coming in with a, a you know presumably relatively high favorability, a lot of excitement because you just want to campaign and your base is fired up. You got big plans for change, big structural change, and people are excited and they want to fight with you. That kind of wanes into your third yeah. year. So, you Jesus. know, I mean, also that, come on, you can really tell someone's priorities when they're like, you know, I will do the X on the first hundred days. Bernie Sanders has said, yeah, he's going to start fighting right away for Medicare for all. And that's a huge difference. Someone's like, yeah, I really care about this. So I'm going to do it uh, in a few years from now. <laughs> I also want to point out there's something flawed in this idea that we're going to win a public option and that's going to prove to people that Medicare for all would be viable. The truth about a public option is that it could also go a completely different way. If we create a public option in the United States, you know, the insurance industry is still in play and they still have tons of money and they can use that money to game the system. Incidentally, a person who explains this very well as Pramila Jayapal, who may or may not be setting herself up to endorse Elizabeth Warren for political reasons. But if you want to see a good video explaining what's wrong with the public option, it's floating around on Twitter right now. Just search Pramila Jayapal public option. And as she explains there, and what is definitely true is that in the United States, the insurance industry is so clever and so powerful that let's say we do fight really hard and somehow manage to win a public option, um, then we still have the insurance industry and they're going to be gaming the system and they're going to make it so that the public option is full of all the sick people and their programs are full of all the healthy people. They're going to use their massive reserves of cash to inflate their programs temporarily to make them seem vastly superior to the public option. The public option obviously is going to be struggling to get off its feet like any new social program is. And so actually this might turn out to be really bad for Medicare for all because people will look at this two-tier system and say, wow, the private insurance plans seem to actually be working for people a lot better than this public option. And if you think that we're going to overcome that problem in two years or one and a half years between, you know, when we pass public option and when Elizabeth Warren presumably wants to start fighting for Medicare for all, I think that's completely delusional. We should just fight for the whole thing. It'll be a little bit harder to win. There's no question about it. Um, maybe it'll be a lot a bit harder to win, but there, it's not like the public option is going to be easy to win. Right. And it could set us up for failure in the fact that we care for yeah. all. Yeah. And now one thing she says, she does say in the first hundred days that she would fight to lower, um, 
prescription costs. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Now, I think yeah. that's huge. Um, um, I mean, just as a, uh, you know, like my own personal story, maybe we can get into both our experiences with the healthcare system uh, in US and abroad. But I went in to get a three uh, eye drops. So I had surgery, broke my face. I got infected because they fucking operated through my eye. <laughs> and uh, three, it was $300 out of pocket for eye drops. $300. Now, and the crazy thing is, is that was the doctor could have prescribed something uh, generic and we, and, and then it took more time to do all this. And okay, it was just 30 bucks. That's a huge freaking difference. That's a huge difference, but that doesn't yeah. happen. Why do you, so, so there, the people are over prescribing doctors are over prescribing way overpriced prescription drugs. And uh, why are they so overpriced? Part of it is, is well, the, these pres prescription companies, they're marketing doctors like crazy, and the government is not uh, negotiating lower prices like they do in other countries. Now, so, so yeah, so I'll, we'll throw, I think this is a, a good thing. Uh, Elizabeth Warren is doing this, but but that she says, she says she's committed to doing this early on. However, to me, it sure seems like someone's, if you're going to make progress with that early on, you'd have a lot more progress getting that through if you were pushing a lot more stuff because then there's an incentive for the other side to be like, okay, we'll give you at, you know, this much, you know? If, is, that, is that a fair argument? That's a good argument. I haven't heard that argument before that if you're actually built, if you're creating a, the sort of threat of Medicare for all that the drug companies are suddenly starting to want to make concessions to yes. stop that. Or, That's I mean, my, the way that I usually think about it is kind of in the reverse, which is hmm. that the only way to actually lower prescription drug costs in this country in a way that makes sense is Medicare for all, because that makes that means the government is the single payer, including the single payer for drugs. And that means that they just have like a ton of that we our, our democratic government has the ability to tell drug companies if you want to if you want to sell your pharmaceutical here it has to be less expensive period i mean mm -hmm. so so yeah but you're totally right that like i mean i think this in general is a really good point uh, you negotiate from a position of strength. The, the stronger you start, especially if you have a mass movement behind you. I mean, I'm not talking about you're some crank, you get up there and nobody wants this thing and you're just like, look, we're going to make you know, some bizarre change that nobody asked for. And that's not what I mean by negotiating from a position of strength. I mean, asking for the maximum thing that there is an actual mass movement behind. And that is Medicare for all. And it's not a public option. It's Medicare for all. Yeah. Um. I let's see. Should, let's let's go into our own story. So let me just say, yeah, like I mentioned before, I broke my fucking face back in, and I like luckily it, it's looking a lot better, you know, a few weeks later. But I uh, I made people notice, like I can't. My smiles are only half. Like I I'm almost like <laughs> I think I'm turning into Harvey Dent. But um, so the um, I asked you. So this was my experience. Quick summary of my experience. I break my face. I I'm in so much pain. Unlike, you know, a normal market decision, I can't really think straight. So I ha have a huge fucking bill for my operation to fix my broken face. And now I haven't had an experience in a universal healthcare system. We, the uh, numbers tell us that other countries pay half as much on healthcare per capita and they're more happy with their service. But since I haven't had a personal experience, I'm, I'm glad you, you do. So can you tell us your experience uh, with universal healthcare in another country? Yeah. I mean, it's not particularly dramatic. It was really simple. It was that I was living in the UK and for a year um, I uh, messed up my foot and my ankle in the States when I was, when I was home, um, went back over there, was having a ton of problems, had just come from the American experience of being passed around from doctors to special hospital, doctor, specialists, et cetera, the whole thing. And so I go to the UK and I figure, Oh, I'm going to have to do this. So I go to my, um, my the primary care physician and they were like, what, well, if you need to see a specialist, what are you doing here? Just go look. There's like a phone book. You just look them up and you just walk right in. And I was like, wow, I guess I was mistaken. Went home, looked up a specialist, walked right in. And, you know, that's it's not a very dramatic experience. I mean, it's, it's a really sort of minor one. Actually, my personal experience tells me that actually the people talk about the red tape involved in government programs. The red tape involved in our private, in our very balkanized, very labyrinthine private healthcare system. I mean, it's astronomical. People are always talking about socialism is going to lead to, you know, complicated bureaucracy 
bureaucracies yeah. and bread lines and long wait line, yeah. long wait times, et cetera. And I'm like, have you I, I experienced the United States healthcare <laughs> system? I mean, yeah. Wait, so you're, tell, you're telling me low. you didn't have to wait a month or a week to get your ankle checked out? <laughs> not only that, but like, it was really easy for me to walk into my private, I mean, walk into my primary care physician. And then they were like, what are you doing here? Just go to a specialist. And it was easy for me to walk okay. into them too. It okay. wasn't easy for me to walk, to be clear. Because my <laughs> yeah, to hobble over. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Now let's, can we, um, got like a little more time. I want to see if, if you can like tackle, this is really the more challenging, complicated stuff, but you know, it, so in Warren's new position, the big difference, uh, other than the fact that she's really not, even though she says she wants to fight hard to do it, she's clearly doesn't want to fight that hard because she's putting it off for several years, but she says that. Um, but other than that, the big difference is how they fund, how they propose to fund it, Bernie versus yeah. what. So can you tell us what that difference is and why, you know, which one you favor and why? Yes. Okay. So this is actually really important and some of it's a little bit confusing. I did write an article for Jacobin about this where before Warren's funding plan came out, everyone knew that her funding plan was going to come out and it was going to be different from Bernie's. I just had a hunch that she was going to be shying away from the idea that we should just tax people in a progressive manner to fund this universal thing. Um, and so I wrote an article that said like, hey, wh what we should do is just progressive taxes. That's the right thing to do for a universal social program. And then lo and behold, she came out and it actually was, you know, I, there are some more details, but I was more or less correct. She just didn't want to, she's really afraid of, of being attacked from the right on raising taxes. Now, Bernie Sanders has years of experience, many, many years of experience explaining how this would work. He, he knows how to, if he's, if someone says, oh, you want to raise our taxes? He's like, yeah, it'll cost less than what you're currently paying for healthcare and everyone will be covered and it will be there for you in your time of need. We're talking about no out-of-pocket costs, go to any doctor you want and do the kitchen table math. This is going to cost you less overall. And, uh, you know, that is something that Elizabeth Warren has been really afraid to say. You saw her in the last debate, not the one that just happened, but the previous one. That was an embarrassing moment for her. Honestly, she was asked multiple times by the moderators if her Medicare for All proposal was going to raise taxes, and she just repeated a canned line over and over again. And, you know, at least, I think Amy Klobuchar was like, at least Bernie's being honest about this. And, you know, I am not a huge fan of Amy Klobuchar, but in that moment, I was nodding along. You know, there's a little yeah. bit of... I think that uh, Elizabeth Warren is triangulating because she's afraid of these right wing attacks. But honestly, we're not going to win Medicare for all or anything as transformational as that. Any sort of big structural change unless we have a leader who's willing and able to respond to right wing attacks just honestly and explain to people, not treat people like they're dumb and not try to hide the truth from people. Just explain to people, yeah, your taxes are going to go up and then you're going to get a universal social good that you can rely on and it's going to make your life a lot easier and it's going to cost you a lot less overall. So what Elizabeth Warren's actual plan does is that in order to get out of the idea that she's taxing the middle class, she wants to instead put a head tax on employers. Now, I am just, you know, I'm just waking up and I'm just having my first cup of coffee because I'm <laughs> West Coast. I'm not going to try to explain to you how this is regressive. Instead, I'm going to point people who are watching this to a couple of uh, Jacobin articles by Matt Brunig. Um, the first one's called Elizabeth Warren's plan to finance Medicare for all is a disaster. And the second one is called Elizabeth Warren's head tax is indefensible. And he'll get into all the wonkery for you if you want to actually understand how these are regressive taxes. But the upshot is that in order to avoid the optics of possibly taxing people more money, and because she wants to, she doesn't want to make that case that I just made and that Bernie frequently makes, she actually opted for a more regressive tax that's going to be more difficult to pull off and frankly worse for low wage workers at the end of the day. So there you go. Thank you, Megan. Um, I, for one, you know, I, I'm not one out to like villainize Elizabeth Warren, but it certainly does see, you know, I think it, but it, at the same time, it's very clear to me that if anybody who's for Medicare for all who wants universal, a, a, a strong universal healthcare system should be supporting Bernie Sanders over Elizabeth Warren. What, yeah. um, you have any, I know you got to leave. Do you write some more awesome articles at Jacobin? What, what, what do you want to say uh, to leave us with? 
Yeah, a parting thought on this. I mean, there's just been so much discourse around like the Bernie bros are all, you know, like constantly attacking Elizabeth Warren. How dare they? And I just want to remind people that these two individuals, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, are currently in competition with each other for the nomination for who's going to go head to head with Donald Trump. And if they beat Donald Trump, who's going to have the highest office in the most powerful nation on earth. And I actually think that it's, um, it doesn't treat the topic with the gravity and the seriousness and the urgency that it deserves for us to like constantly be demanding that, that, that we not criticize a candidate who ought to be considered an ally, broadly speaking. So um, I'm going to keep talking about why I think Elizabeth Warren is not the best candidate for Medicare for all. I hope other people will too. The trick is always to just be respectful and not say anything that you would feel embarrassed of afterward. But, you know, it's a bit of a note of encouragement to other people to get out there and have these conversations about, you know, who's going to actually fight with us to win the kind of society that we need. Awesome. Megan Day, thanks for spending a little time with me today. <laughs> Please. You like that? You like it? You ever you ever heard any play like that before? I'm sure. Okay. All right. I'll catch you later. All right. Peace. <laughs> Fuck you, Matt. You're making my cock fall off. Man, great job, Matt. He goes by the name Orf. Wonderful job. So call him Matt. Cause I don't want to butcher his name. Matt Orphalia. Matt Orphalia. Matt Orphalia. Subscribe to him. Matt Orphalia. Matt Orphalia. Matt Orphalia. Matt Orphalia. <laughs> Incredible.